uh, we could not get through our first year podcasting the history of the occult without talking about Crowley. Alistair Crowley. Uh, we owe our name to Crowley's autobiography. Wait, is it Crowley, Crowley. or Crowley? That's it. Where there's, Crowley. This is going to be a... Crowley? I'm going to yell Crowley, Crowley every time. This is going to be a, a hot that. topic on today's episode, mm. how to pronounce this name, but it's going to be a hot topic that we don't debate because Olivia will simply say... Crowley. And I will say... <laughs> Crowley. I will say both. Because wild card man, wild wild card. you're the wild card. <laughs> we owe our name to his autobiography, The Confessions of Alistair C R O W L E Y. <laughs> Triggered. So it's about time we got around to sharing his confessions with our audience. Although occultism is several hundred years old, we talk about its esoteric predecessors stretching back into the tribal origins of humankind. Uh, at popular interest in things occult, however, underwent a resurgence in uh, the Western world, uh, in America in particular, during the spiritualist movement from the 1850s to the 1870s, and then in Europe during what's called the occult revival, which began in the 1880s and lasted through the turn of the century, uh, popularly called the fin de siècle. Ooh. Pop, that's yeah. popular? I've never I heard like that before that in my life, Rob. Well, fanc- fancily called okay. the fin de siècle. <laughs> By fancy folk like me. Who has time to call Uh, that? (laughs) European occultism involved the formation of secret groups, practicing vaguely Masonic rituals, as well as practical experiments in controlling non-material beings. We're like a secret group. Except that we tell everybody about us. Well, shh. We're a secret. secret. Oh, you're right. Known to Canadians, Australians, hmm. Londoners. Scots. Yeah, we're pretty open. But, the odd Mexican here and there. Well. As a secret group. But we, we guess we have our secrets. I guess it's the point of a podcast. If people <laughs> know us so they can listen to you us. You can't have a secret podcast. We are, we are titularly the secret order. Yes, that's true. So there are we do have some secrets. We don't oh. know what they are yet. We haven't identified them. In any case. <laughs> where were we going with that, Shannon? I just... I just want to be a part of a secret group. Okay, okay I well, I was hoping this could be it for me. It, we are like a secret group insofar as uh, in the occult revival, these vaguely Masonic groups with their practical experiments involved a lot of robes and wands and Kabbalistic formulas, which, as you'll know, is a regular feature of what we do here. I love yeah. all of those All things. of the wands that we're constantly <laughs> yeah, we having to, to juggle more, while podcasting. More wands? James I lo- I lo- is just, yeah. like, throwing so yeah, many wands up in the air. I left right mine now. at home today, actually. Yeah, that's, that's probably I for the best. Because a... we keep hearing clunking on the mic i think yeah. we shouldn't have the wands all the time yeah but how else are we going to get this sound into this machine <laughs> you're right wand asmr <laughs> i have a robe it's more like a, a santa claus robe it's it from a it was a gift from james's mom from magical <laughs> santa claus robe. Victoria's Victoria's like a bathroom oh yeah Can you wear that like, to our next break? but it's like a santa claus robe it's like a sexy that'll be santa good for robe. the holidays yeah yes. you can wear it for the podcast no for a christmas see. card so crowley was a member <laughs> and eventual disruptor and then destructor of the most famous of these groups the hermetic order of the golden dawn which is what we've been winding around to slowly here. Uh, He was, hands down, the most notorious practitioner of the Kabbalah-inspired, tarot-infused, quasi-yogic brand of occultism dominating the popular imagination at the close of the century. Crowley is a major figure in the occult world because of his creative genius. Now, when I say creative genius, I mean a spiritually creative genius. Crowley did not understand himself to be making up a religion or a religious practice off the top of his head. He was divinely inspired. His genius was his ability to tap into uh, uh, this otherworldly source and to translate what he discovered there in a way that both laid bare and kept hidden the depth of his vision. And therein lies his occultism. Both the publicizing of what he's up to, right, the publishing of all of his books and and the putting his personality out there and garnering interest the way he did um but also that he maintained these occult secrets right and occultism is in part about secrets so yes shannon i think we do have secrets Ooh. And those <laughs> secrets are <laughs> the mysteries that sort of sit at the center of every episode right most recently is jill story guilty or innocent um is human sacrifice black magic or not? Like, we are probing these mysteries that ultimately 
don't have straightforward answers. Similarly with Crowley, he's going to speak in codes and he's going to have access <laughs> to mysteries yeah. that even if he wanted to, he couldn't quite articulate for his audience. He couldn't make clear or plain to them. And he's even going to play some games trying to disguise that. Book of the law. For example. <laughs> uh, during his lifetime, a popular newspaper, the tabloid John Bull, labeled Crowley the wickedest man in the world. Uh. He tried. He, he, <laughs> I'm going to say Olivia's this all the time swimming. through the whole episode. <laughs> he actually tried to um, sue them. I don't know if he actually legally sued them, but he tried to oppose them in any way that he could and accuse them of slandering him because they so actively attacked him. Um, so this idea that he welcomed this negative publicity is a bit of a misnomer. He, he actually was not thrilled with being called the wickedest man in the world because let's bear in mind, Hitler lives at this time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> for one. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, anyway, his association with black magic per se uh, is perhaps a little unfair, as what I'm trying to get at here. But that's what makes him a perfect subject for the black magic series. Crowley's perceived wickedness was the product of his ethical philosophy and his boundary breaking occult practice. Today, we're going to focus on the radical morality he promoted by looking at the first half of his life leading up to and including the writing of the Book of the Law, as Olivia's just mentioned, with its famous maxim, to do what thou wilt. Now, a, a little caveat here. This is not Crowley's favorite book. His favorite book is the Book of Lies, which he wrote at lunchtime every day. You at, know, After he wrote casual. the Book of the Law. <laughs> but the Book of the Law is sort of like the formative philosophy. Like, this is when he's really getting down um, or it, it, being divinely inspired with some idea. I feel like you really get a sense of Crowley from reading it. Like, yeah. you start to really get who he is. And this is the first time he's really putting this philosophy out there for everybody. I brought mine. Neat. <laughs> Fun fact. <laughs> Some interpreted uh, the Book of the Law's maxim, do what thou wilt, to mean that humans could do, do whatever they wanted, regardless of any religious or moral system. To some extent, this is true. But the meaning and history of this occult commandment is, as most things are on this podcast, a bit more complicated than that. My name is Rob C. Thompson, Doctor of the Occult and Supreme Hierophant of the Secret Order of Alchemical Actors. Beside me, at long last, finally returning, uh, Olivia Literal, our Grand Master of the Secret Order. But um, sick, but here. Yeah, a little she's under the weather. Mostly here. Yeah. <laughs> Olivia would have been with us uh, for our previous episode, but she's been a little bit under the weather. But Crowley brought me back. I've right. been revived. She's, she's, she's dragged herself out of her sick bed in order to podcast the Crowley. Uh, we've got Shannon Landers back at the mic. Hello cool and uh james also back at the mic james Caplangis. i am captain of the table and i'm here to podcast nice wow. thank you i was working on it yeah, james has been practicing what he's gonna what say none of the things you practiced are what you just said though right well uh i panicked rob that's exactly what happened we the members oh, of, of the, the secret, secret order, order of alchemical, alchemical actors do solemnly commit ourselves to a full and honest telling of the history of the occult as far as we know it. Let's start uh, the business portion of today's meeting with some words of thanks. R A Z. Ooh. S-Z-Y. Joined our joyful family of patrons this week. R A is a resident of one of my favorite cities in the world. He's a Londoner. Cool. Uh, and I've actually been enjoying a very nice exchange with him across the old Patreon messenger service. Thank you, R.A. Thank yeah, you. Yes. Uh, he told me that he's reading uh, Crowley's Book of the Law, and if you go on our Patreon page, he's actually po oh, he's reading the Confession, sorry. Uh, and if you go on our Patreon page, he posted a picture of his cat sleeping oh. with the Book of the Law. Uh, oh. I'm sorry, with the Confessions. I keep saying Book of the Law. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> My heart. Uh, we've also had a review from Llama Lumps. Uh, and okay. <laughs> Llama Lumps spells lumps with a double L uh, at the front of both words. That is beautiful. That's yeah, clever. super cool. I like it. Very clever stuff. Uh, Llama is enjoying our research, and I don't want you guys to get a big head, but she said she really likes the, or she or he, really likes the alchemical actor's personalities. Aww. Yeah. That's the nicest thing anyone's Yay. ever said about me. <laughs> also, uh, Sam, my student Sam, has become uh, a fan of the Sam podcast. Fan. 
That Sam, thank you. Uh, it it kind of did. It's a faux rhyme. He's joined our Patreon team, and I've decided that today is his day. We're going to give him a tryout as one of our, our voices for the first time today. Don't, Don't mess up. Oh. Yeah. So, S- Sam, you just want to call to the people from your place on the outer ring there? Hey. All right, nice. Oh, he uh, waved. He, he waved, waved, waved to you all. I don't know if you guys it's heard that. It's a podcast. That. So. It's a podcast. He'll get the hang of it. He's new to this. He'll get the hang of it. <laughs> Uh, okay, and I'd also like to see, maybe we'll see if we can find a technique, maybe we can get some of our uh, other patrons and, and fans to record things, and we can, like, post them up. And we have guest speakers. Yeah. Aw. Friends. Well, you know, they could just, like, do little announcements, like, you're listening to Occult Confessions. Ooh, yeah. You know, cool stuff Ooh. like that, yeah. But, like, from London and Australia, all our friends. Oh, my God. And Wouldn't accents. that be cool? Yeah, oh, what the accents. accents! Yeah, we can't wait to get those accents on here. Wow. All right, then, uh... Shannon, you are the uh, Instagram master. So, Is that uh, my title, though? Oh, she, do you want a title first before we mm. get to the cat poll? Because people are really interested in this cat poll. We'll, tit- we'll title you. We'll title you. Fine, okay, fine. Okay. We'll do Okay, so <laughs> Shannon uh, is due for her title. We've already distributed a couple titles mm-hmm. so far. Uh, Brianna's the human of the third knob. I'm captain of the table. Uh, yes, of course, yeah, we have yeah, Olivia as our grandmaster. I'm our supreme hierophant. So uh, now Shannon we're gonna join, is going to join the joyful team of people with titles. Yes. What what title should that be? Well, James's mom said my title should have the word inquisitor. Right, James's in it. mom. Inquisitor. Been, hello, James's mom. Ooh. Hey, mom. Hi, we know you've been. Li- we've heard you've been listening. We appreciate it. Okay, so James's mom has been listening, and she uh, suggested inquisitor. I, I like that. I think inquisitor is a nice title. But Inks. historically, we had the Holy Inquisition, and we had a Grand Inquisitor. So we need some sort of qualifier for that. We can't just leave inquisitor hanging. Insta inquisitor. Instaquisitor. <laughs> Instaquisitor. Inquisitor. That's a pretty great one. Is that it? Or the, the instant inquisitor. I was thinking uh, maybe the the wizard inquisitor or the lizard inquisitor. <laughs> lizard inquisitor. I think someone or said silly? bedazzled inquisitor. <laughs> bedazzled inquisitor. Well, what do we think? What are our votes there? I like the insta inquisitor. It was very organic. In- yeah, it did. It just came out of that. Let's uh, let's hear from the outer circle here. Uh, we're trying a new thing today. We have a sort of a live uh, audience of our <laughs> our outer circle who are going to be doing the voices. So we got everybody in the room here. Uh, so can you guys just by a show of applause, uh, how well do you like? Was it instaquisitor? Instaquisitor. Instaquisitor. How about very nice. how about wizard inquisitor? Oh, uh, a one clap from Jacob. <laughs> Jacob's a one clap. How about man. Uh, be- bedazzled inquisitor? <laughs> wow! Why does everyone love that one so much? I don't know. It's bizarre. I kind of like the other ones <laughs> myself. Uh, I'm gonna overrule them. You're going to be the uh, insta yeah. in- insta inquisitor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's funny how we talked about how. I don't know if this outer order thing is gonna work out. They're <laughs> making bedazzled. terrible decisions She's already. Not even bedazzled. bedazzled. <laughs> She's wearing a sweater. You are the supreme. <laughs> Or the I am the supreme you know. hierophant. This is a dictatorship. I've spoken. <laughs> okay, now Shannon, uh, how... let's get to this. Uh, oh, what? Oh, I, was saying, I think it's funny how we talk about how I'm in charge of the Instagram because I am. But whenever I make Instagram posts, I pretend like it's not me. Like I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tag myself in posts. Like look at these cookies. Our alchemical actor You're Shannon too- did. <laughs> the secret's out. The secret's out. That's your secret. That was my group. That was <laughs> my. That was your occult secret. I was by myself in my little group. <laughs> Just expose yourself, Shannon. All right, speaking of your new role, yes. Instaquisitor, uh, let us uh, hear our... We, so we had the creepy cat, which Olivia has brought in He's today. Yes. Um, He's lovely. And we were trying to name the creepy cat. So we've had a poll on Instagram. This is the end of our business meeting today. For those of you who are anxious to get to Aleister Crowley, we apologize so much business, as Shannon says. Yeah. Uh, but what are the results of our creepy cat poll, our mascot? All right. Well, the winner of this contest was Louis Von Elric. Louis nice. Von Elric! Yes, Von Elric. yes. Aww. And uh, that is actually from Sam, who's sitting in the oh, back. Oh, Sam's He's having a big day. Yeah. It's a big day for Sam. I'm with happy him. birthday, yeah. Sam. Happy but birthday. It's not my birthday. Happy, <laughs> hol- happy Hanukkah. I would like to do a couple shout nope. outs. So, <laughs> shout out. Plant <laughs> Life for Two and Ghouly Go Lightly both did write ins for Fergus. Oh, my God. Okay. So, thank go. you. <laughs> Uh, yes, Plant Life for Two said he still liked Fergus, and Ghoulie Go Lightly said, I'm exercising my right to write in a vote for Fergus. Fergus so, can be his middle name. No, no. Fourth middle name? I think <laughs> Elric you should. Von, what is it? Elric Von. Louis, Louis, Louis Von, Von Elric. Elric. Yes. That, Semicolon that's Fergus. But it's pronounced yes. Fergus. <laughs> it's pronounced Fergus. <laughs> 
you want us perfect. to come out with t-shirts that just say, I still liked Fergus? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I'll get on that. Yeah. That's right. our only merch. Uh, like let's Fergie. let's close up this business meeting and get to the uh, the work of podcasting, shall we? Business. Okay. Adjourned. Should business we have a, adjourned. Do we need a ritual for this? Oh. Um, we could just light somebody's phone on fire. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that under advisement. Every single time. We all hold hands and say, done. <laughs> Business. I kind of like James's better for the uh, the sheer drama of it. Um, okay. So, Alistair Crowley was born Edward Alexander Crowley on the 12th of October, 1875. It was the same year that Eliphas Levy, uh, the, one of the major, if not the major figure of French occultism, died, and also the same year that Helena Blavatsky and Henry Alcott founded the Theosophical Society. What a so, year. Big year for occultism. Puts you all in the, in the timeline of things. His father, Edward, made his fortune selling ales. Not like ailments. Il- oh, il- oh, ailments. Ill- Ill- what am I saying? Illnesses. <laughs> like like ailments is in like mead and stuff. Yeah, mead. Cool. I don't know. Grog. Ale. I don't know. How many other words? Uh, <laughs> We should still be titling Shannon now. Grog Quisitor. And then retired. So his father sold ales, and then he got, like, he felt guilty about it because he got everybody drunk. So he retired to preach for the Plymouth Brethren. The Brethren were essentially a non-denominational movement attempting to unite Christians under one singular roof. <laughs> Good weird. luck. Yeah, right? Uh, not, not very occult, though. His father died when he was 11, and Crowley lost his Aww. virginity to a servant girl uh, with a crush on him when he was 14. We're just tearing through his childhood here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> like, is that related? <laughs> the hot right? okay. Okay. Nope. okay. Unrelated facts. But I'm things, keeping up with you. Things that happen nonetheless. I mean, they might be related. I don't know. Maybe you lose your virginity younger when your dad's dead. I don't know. <laughs> Crowley, <laughs> I'm just putting that out there as a possibility. Crowley, is that why we're here? <laughs> we don't read I'm confused. <laughs> Rob's got the PhD. Yeah, yeah, I can say whatever I want. He it's says just it, it how must it be true. Is. I'm doing the wild carding for you guys today. You, <laughs> you can sit back. Crowley nearly died himself when he lit an oversized firework on Gee Fox Day um, oh. and was out cold for 96 hours. So Gee Fox oh Day gosh. just happened. It's the 5th of November. <gasps> that was our... Yeah, that's it. That was our three-year anniversary. Yeah. Really? You guys yeah. have your, your... Well, it was the day after my birthday. <laughs> so, Guy Fox. <laughs> what is Guy Fox? Guy Rob? Fox, um, in 1605, uh, on the no- 5th of November, 1605, Guy Fox, uh, along with a crew uh, of Catholics, attempted to blow up the Parliament building along with King James. So, King James I was supposed to be inside, um, but he got caught. Guy Fox wasn't even in charge of the plot, but he was the guy whose job it was to stand underneath of Parliament. So there was a tunnel underneath, and he stood there with all the gunpowder. So he was the guy that got caught. So ever since, uh, children have gone door to door in uh, Great Britain with effigies of Guy, and they ask for money. They say, penny for the old Guy, and you get money. Oh, that's uh, kind of cool. A little scarecrow, yeah, you drag a scarecrow around. Sort of like Halloween. But with that money. Would be way more yeah. fun you carry, than Halloween. And then, so you carry the scarecrow and you're like, give him money? Is right, because he is this poor, dumb guy. And then there's fireworks, oh. and then sometimes you almost die. Yeah, yeah. Natalie okay. Portman. Oh, there's there. fireworks. Yeah, there's a bonfire <laughs> and there's fireworks. So Crowley was there, you know, lighting his fireworks like, like a dumb American. One. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, like a dumb American on the 4th of July, and he almost blew himself up. <clears throat> sort of like Key Fox. So uh, Crowley had a stormy relationship with his mother, moving right along with the childhood, who referred to him as the Beast, oh. referring to the Beast from Revelation. Uh, but he later decided to go ahead and own that name, the Beast. To... I would definitely own that. <laughs> right. and that's how he marketed himself to the world. He had three major passions, women, climbing mountains, and the occult. All three of my favorite Passion. That's right. No, <laughs> those are all my James that's, can confirm this. I can confirm. Women climbing mountains and occultism. Yep. Or Shannon's favorite thing. Those yep. are my favorite At things. At the same time. Yep. <laughs> Occult women climbing mountains. She, yeah. <laughs> so, so like Olivia you. on El Capitan <laughs> is just, your idea yeah. of a good time. Just climbing all that's you. <laughs> Shannon's down below just watching. <laughs> the binoculars clapping. like, yes, yes. <laughs> This is what I like. 
break's coming up. It's also what <laughs> Aleister Crowley likes. Yeah, fun fact. He arrived at the uh, first two of his interests early in life, and the third one, occultism only as a young adult. After graduating from Cambridge, uh, while mountaineering, he met a mountaineering chemist named Julian Baker, who in turn introduced him to the alchemist George Cecil Jones. So that sort of gives you his first connections to the wild world of He occultism. went to Cambridge. He was, he, was he wealthy? Yeah. Or rather Because of all that ale his dad sold. Oh, okay. Let's hear from Crowley. He possessed a fiery but unstable temper was the son of a suicide and bore a striking resemblance to many conventional representations of Jesus Christ. His spirit was both ardent and subtle. He was very widely read in magic, and being by profession an analytical chemist, was able to investigate the subject in a scientific spirit. At this point, Crowley was beginning to develop his occult curiosities. Baker and Jones instructed Crowley to read Samuel L. Mather's recently published book of Abramelin the Mage, and they were impressed by his dedication to learning its secrets. So, they introduced him to the Order of the Golden Dawn. Crowley became a neophyte at 2 p.m. on the 26th of November, 1898. <laughs> neophyte like a, at 2 yeah. p.m. That's, That's like, like, it's like an initiate. <laughs> Right. It does give you an idea of like the uh, nice picture of it. It's not like midnight. I'm gonna name a play that. It's like in the, it's the middle of the day. It is. It's when you're. So it's just. It's like a, at a convenience, right? It's a casual. Like when Catholics meet on Wednesday night. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's like this is easier in the afternoon rather than like get schlepping out of bed at midnight to come over and do this. Just do it we're at two p.m. Out. Yeah, we're out. It's the <laughs> afternoon. We're like, this errands. is when people are doing things. In the midst of his ascendancy at the Golden Dawn, he met Alan Bennett. Uh, who, when he first encountered Crowley, told him that he saw Goetia, ma malignant or lowly spirits, attending the young occultist. We might call them elementals. Mm. As a teenager, Bennett had renounced God when he learned how children came into the world. <laughs> as, a, as a teenager? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and he said the Lord's Prayer backwards to conjure the devil. Ah, oh. see so you like him better now. It is really funny. So if you think about it, you're like an uptight uh, British guy, and you're like 14, and someone points to you know your your mother's midsection and says, "Babies come out of that." So there is no God. <laughs> Immediately starts saying. If, it, if God's job isn't to like send storks with babies right, to, to send us, like babies what's, down and raise a I light. thought he like built them like little sims and dressed them up and sent them down that might still be happening somewhere in our I simulated universe I too was universe. very upset when I found out babies didn't hatch from rocks so <laughs> Bennett suffered from asthma and had realized the occult potential of the opium he was prescribed to treat his condition he nice. was responsible for uh, re introducing Crowley to the mysticism of opium induced experience and led Crowley's first experiments in magical drug use Bennett was in poor health when Crowley met him, and he needed to move to a different climate, but he was too poor to pay for the trip. Crowley had vowed never to give direct financial support to any of his friends uh, because of what it could lead to, meaning, like, you know, everyone and their mother hits you up for cash. But he wanted to help Bennett, one of the few friends he never turned on in the course of his entire life. He's notorious for turning, to just being over people. You know, uh, you said that they need, he needed to be in a different climate. What, where were they? Uh, England. Okay, so yeah. yeah, it was just cold, I guess. Cold and wet. and wet. Yeah, which is not. I mean, at this time period, you wanted to be in a Spain. high dry, high dry climate. Yeah, right. yeah. Uh, so uh, it just so happened that Crowley had been sleeping with a married woman and had soured on the relationship. She was distraught without him and told him she would do anything he wanted. He asked her to give Bennett one hundred pounds to move to Ceylon, which is now Sri Lanka. Oh wow, that's really far away. Yeah. Uh, and then Crowley was like, okay, now I'm done with you. So <laughs> she was like, I'll do anything you want. And he was like, okay, cool, do this. That doesn't mean that I'm not going gonna, gonna to get back together with you. You just said you would do anything I wanted, and I told you a thing that I wanted you to do. Crowley is Scorpio. <laughs> well, well no, what is he? What did I, I say? Know, I he was remember. born in October. Is he a Scorpio? I think he might be, what? yeah. Yeah, of let course me, he's let me go a Scorpio. Back. <laughs> 
Christmas. You go back. Didn't I say the 12th of October, right? So that happened. So off <laughs> goes Bennett to Sri Lanka. While there, Bennett joined a Buddhist monastery. Later, when Crowley went to visit him, he taught Crowley the secrets of yoga. And Crowley claimed to have seen Bennett floating in midair, being blown around like a leaf. Crowley, although an admirer of the Buddha, was never tempted to join a monastery himself. Nor did I agree that the Buddha was altogether right. I thought it a great mistake to interfere with physiological processes. I was perfectly aware that greed, lust, and hatred were the enemies of peace. But I was also aware that forcing oneself to abstain from food, love, and society could only result in diverting the natural appetites into abnormal channels. He retreated to Loch Ness in the infamous house at Boleskin, where he conjured shadows and prepared talismans, working toward new heights of adeptship. Olivia, do you know much about the Abramelin working at the house at Boleskin? Mm, no. So the goal here, um, so, so basically, there's a few legends about how Crowley chose the house. The first one is, or, or the major one is, that he had heard that there had been a church fire on the site where the house was built. Ooh. And the congregants had been uh, inexplicably confined during the fire so that they all burned up and died inside. So it was already this sort of very charged space. Uh, and then the house was arranged in such a way that I don't, I'm not, I don't know the exact layout, but there was like a, doors were at the different uh, poles, so oh, okay. or, or, or you know, sort of like um, verandas. Okay. So he could get to those spaces as he needed to, in order to invoke his guardian angel number one. But in order to invoke his guardian angel, he had to invoke the twelve kings of hell. You know. I mean, this is actually not the first time we've heard of the twelve kings of hell. In the Gilles de Rey episode, we just talked about uh, Prelati, uh, a conjurer that Gilles de Rey employed, invoking kings of hell. Where do they come from? What, what is that? He, yeah, where does that find its root? Yeah, that's what I was hell? Ask, like, <laughs> <laughs> Did he, like, did, like, come up with this? Is like their... So it comes from the Abramelin working, um, and initially Mather's book that he studied. Oh, okay. So he's he actually... Uh, employs the right he's going to work through the right he's got to abstain from food and sex for a long time and he's got to like sort of be in this house cut off from the world for a long while to get through this full right the goal being to invoke the kings of hell in order to then get contact with his guardian angel so he's contacting demons but it's not actually supposed to be this you know evil demonic thing that he's doing mm -hmm. his ultimate goal is to reach that guardian angel that um, sort of super spirit that's associated with him personally did, uh, what's his face, uh, what's his name, Mathers? Did he, like, after the order, he didn't really do a whole lot, did he? Yeah, Mathers wasn't involved in this. He kind of, like, faded, Yeah, he fades though, out right? of the picture. We're, we're going to get to Mathers now. Um, there's an air of foreboding around Crowley's work in Scotland, though, first of all. Um, Jones, Cecil Jones, wouldn't join him. Another magician, uh, Charles Rocher, came out but left without warning one morning. And he and Crowley didn't speak again for several years. Mm. So he just walked out without saying a word. That's rude. And then when they met again, neither Crowley nor Rocher said a single word about Rocher's unexplained departure from Boleskin, um, which would have been the last time they'd seen each other. So it was like if James came to my house, walked out, didn't say anything, then three <laughs> years later... Is the next time I see James, and we don't mention that he just left my house <laughs> that one day. He just shows up in her audition. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, hey, man. So, okay, let's just get back to it. Yeah, let's get, let's get yeah. <laughs> We've been waiting for you. <laughs> or like, if in the middle of this podcast, James just leaves. And then <laughs> and five then episodes season. from now, <laughs> she walks back in. All right, Captain, the table's here. <laughs> yeah, and we just keep going. We don't ask each other what happened there or... Uh, as if that wasn't enough, the innkeeper where Crowley was staying went mad, got ragingly drunk, and tried to kill his wife and children. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and incidentally, Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin fame purchased Boleskin House. Of course. Yeah. And uh, the legend is that, so Robert Plant, also of Led Zeppelin, yeah. his five-year-old son died tragically. Uh, Jimmy Page had a heroin addiction problem that was so bad that at one point he couldn't stand up while playing guitar on stage. Um, and then Bonham, their drummer, died an alcoholic in 1980. Ooh. So there's, you know, kind of a, this is like one of those etic curse situations that we talked yeah. about in the evil eye. Like we look at this and be like, whoa, you bought that evil house and I've all those demons are house. in there. So the theories are either that 
uh, well, okay, so here's what happens. Mathers um, calls to Crowley. So the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn was founded initially by William Wynne Westcott in 1887, just popping off Scotland for a second here. Uh, on a little white lie, though. So this guy, William Wynne Westcott, claimed that the Secret Order of the Golden Dawn, Hermetic Order, sorry, we're the Secret yes. Order. Right. We're they're the they're Hermetic Order. Hermetic. He claimed that the Order's rituals uh, were not his own invention, but had been lifted from a translation of an old occult cipher. This gave the Order a kind of secret legitimacy, with a connection to a lodge of secret chiefs guiding the work of the Golden Dawn. Too bad it's all a lie, right, Rob? Well, yeah, uh, the notion of secret chiefs is getting, was increasingly popular. Helena Blavatsky really got this going, and uh, I guess this is a teaser for our next season, which is going to be about Helena Blavatsky's secret chiefs and whether or not they were real. But uh, William Wynne Westcott's really picking up on this trend that everybody's got secret chiefs hiding out somewhere, like secret Rosicrucians or whatever. Uh, but neither the translation nor the cipher ever existed, James. You are correct, sir. Woo! Yeah. Captain. Uh, when S.L. Mathers <laughs> took over control of the Golden Dawn, he claimed that Westcott had forged his connection to the Secret Chiefs and that he, Mathers, was the only one who had a true connection. So the Secret Chiefs are real. Woo! But Westcott <laughs> made up his connection to them. Aw. Uh, and since Mathers had a special connection to them, he had carte blanche to begin rewriting the Order's practices, right? So the Order's practices had been based on a false connection to Secret Chiefs that this guy made up. And Mathers is like, well, screw that guy. I really know the Secret Chiefs, so I'm going to trash everything that you were doing, and we're going to start over, but with the stuff I want to do. Mm-hmm. Like if Olivia came in and just started podcasting about reptilians. Huh. Sounds like a good idea and for every an episode. episode. <laughs> every episode from now on is just reptilians. I and... feel like that would create a lot of uh, uneasiness in the order, though. Like, I bet a lot of people didn't like that. Yes. Some people, at least. In or fact, it created everyone a division. Would yeah. I would like the reptilians. I want to be educated Thank about you. the... <clears throat> this, uh, this rejection of Westcott and rewriting of the Golden Dawn's work was not welcomed by all. Really? And Called some it. rebelled. Huh. So James would just get up and leave, and you would come back six episodes later, and you wouldn't know why. <laughs> uh, Mathers was living in Paris, and he sent Crowley to get control of the rebellious members of the Order. Crowley was miffed that they had not elevated him to the highest level, in, the, in the, the, old, the Golden Dawn, and his interference caused the group to dissolve into pieces. Um, so there's a couple of things happening here. Um, first, Crowley cuts off his Abramelin working in Scotland in order to go and mess around with the Golden Dawn and basically crash it. Right. He crashes it right into the side of a <laughs> And then mountain. walks away and becomes wildly like, success, like right. successful. Right, yeah, starts does his own thing. Um, so because he'd conjured these 12 kings of hell, though, there are two theories about what happened to them. The first one is that they possessed Crowley so that his career ever afterwards was being guided by or haunted by the 12 kings of hell. Mm. The second theory is that they remained with the house, which would explain why Jimmy Page, all those, you know, 50 years later, experienced what he experienced so at Bolskin House. For the first theory that um, they were kind of using him, like uh, the devils were using Crowley, um... Did he have a change in, like, personality at all for people to assume that? Or are they just kind of like, oh, maybe they're in his body now? Who knows? Well, I think naturally he's a young man, um, and he's coming into his own occult-wise, right? He's starting to develop his own occult theory. So it's difficult to say if he's had a change in personality yeah. because he's... <laughs> he's just a growing also, boy. Also, a he's deep, well, he's digging deeper and deeper into this stuff, which is going to make you weirder and weirder. You also yeah. mentioned, like, uh, magical drug use. Is that mm-hmm. was he experimenting with these drugs He's himself? Beginning to experiment with the drugs, okay. yeah. yeah. Was, that, was he doing that in Sri Lanka when he saw his friend floating? <laughs> it gets much worse. I don't know. We did talk about the yogis in the first season doing magical things. Remember the guy that ripped his intestines out yeah, and put no, them back they in? They are amazing people. <laughs> I don't. I don't mean to belittle. They're an amazing the, people. The, the, the we yogis. love the yogis here. We do. James Especially. doesn't want any yogi. I don't think there are yogi curses, James. I don't think you have to worry about that. I, mean, I haven't thought about that episode in a while. Yeah. I remember doing a voice. I was like eating chips in the audience. <laughs> we were like doing a little bit, of, like watching this person pull out his guts. And oh yeah, like, yeah, yeah. We were just babies then. Yeah, I was just. We were just. We were tiny just little podcasters. Tiny podcasters. Tiny little, but we've gotten so much bigger. <laughs> the more you podcast, the bigger you get. Yes, I used to, I'm like six feet tall now. So Crowley packs up and heads for Mexico. <laughs> Congratulations. I walk away for two seconds. <laughs> he heads for Mexico to continue his occult explorations and to climb a few mountains. 
Also, to bed a few ladies. Hell yeah. Uh, not on the mountains, Shannon. Oh, but he man. wasn't especially fond of the food or the alcohol, which was a personality trait going back to childhood. This is pretty funny. Let's hear from Crowley himself. I used to refuse sometimes, under embarrassing pressure, to taste things whose appearance or whose name displeased me. I would not eat jam, even as a child, because it looked messy. I must have been nearly 40 before I would touch salad. It seems absurd. I was very fond of lobster mayonnaise. But lobster salad? Never! I dislike the combination of consonants. In Mexico, Crowley practiced a dance that precipitated a complete loss of ego. But rather than going unconscious, it caused him to emerge into what he called a lucid state in which he had no personality or personal thoughts. Kind of mysti mystical state of being. He became the vehicle of the divine. He practiced becoming invisible. So just He never did it, he just practiced it? No, he did it. Oh, okay. He got to the point where he was able to walk down the road in a red robe and gold crown without being noticed. I'm in love with him. <laughs> All right, but now I just want to introduce the possibility that if I saw someone walking down the road in a red robe and gold crown, just I would pretend not to see right? him. Yeah, I would, I would turn, I would avert my eyes. He's innovative. I wouldn't make eye contact. <laughs> and I actually, Crowley was aware of what I just said. I think that is in part what he was trying to do. When he says he made himself invisible, I think that might be what he meant. He just like made he people feel know. uncomfortable. Are you enough that they wouldn't look at him. Are you sure that like people weren't looking at him? Maybe he was just like looking at the floor. He's like, no one's looking at me. I don't see them looking at me. Like, I, I don't see you. You don't see me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he had an affair with a married woman in Juarez and sampled Again. the local population. One afternoon in Mexico, I picked up a woman who attracted me by the insatiable intensity of passion that blazed from her evil, inscrutable eyes and tortured her worn face into a whirlpool of seductive sin. I passed some hours with her in her slum. Crowley approved of the Mexican attitude towards sex, which he saw as generally more free and open. The problem of sex, which has reduced Anglo-Saxon nations to hysteria and sanity, has been solved in Mexico by the cooperation of climate and cordiality. His friend Oscar Eckenstein paid him a visit. Eckenstein was not a big fan of magical pursuits, which he thought scattered Crowley's attention, and he promised to train Crowley's mind in concentration and telekinesis, both of which Crowley <laughs> got good at in short order. Oh, you thought this guy was going to be like, you should really learn math. Yeah, I was about to say, like, what else <laughs> What else was he good at besides the occult? And then I thought I was about to find out. And he's like, no, telekinesis. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> which is far more practical than conjuring demons in hell. And math. Then he and Eckenstein did some mountain climbing for a while, and Crowley took a little trip to Texas. Uh, Molly Ivins, a, a contemporary person, journalist, described Texas as being a lot like America, only more so. Americans, according to Crowley, had no interest in fairness. If they knew a way to cheat, the only thing holding them back was their chance of being caught. Crowley did not have the best impression of Americans, even though he spent a long while living as an expatriate in New York. Coming straight from the quiet civilization of Mexico, it was a terrible shock to find myself in touch with the coarse and brutal barbarism of Texas. There are many unpleasant sides of life which cannot be avoided without shirking reality altogether, but in the United States they were naked and horrible. The lust of money raged stark without the softening influences of courtesy. Drunkenness was stripped of good fellowship, the sisterhood of sin presented no deceptive attractions, they carried on their business with fierce commercial candor. We're trying to get a feel for the man and where he's coming from. So this is as good an opportunity as any to remind ourselves in defense of America that Crowley is an upper class guy. He's an independently wealthy jet setting playboy climbing up and down mountains and women across <laughs> the globe. Climbing up women. How large are these women? How large are they? Six feet. Much like You're yourself. Oh, ooh. <laughs> thinking about that. I was like, I'm six feet tall. That's really not that tall. I should have went Yeah, higher. you could have You could have definitely like said 12, six shot feet? the moon there. I mean, like... We're only one tall. year into the podcast. I mean, we're less than a year You're into right. the podcast, so you I could have, get taller. I have room to grow. A genteel European attitude holds that the pursuit of money in all its guises is crass. But Americans' open lust for it is especially crass. I don't entirely disagree, given my general distaste for American commercialism and materialism, but... Uh, I like America, uh, Crowley's Ooh. bias has to stand. Uh, there's a bit of irony in it, insofar as he was among the most shamelessly self-promoting occultists in the history of occultism. And we occultists 
are pretty well known for our shameless self-promotion. Uh, thank you for listening to Occult Confessions. <laughs> yeah, follow our Patreon. Please follow our Patreon, Instagram, and Facebook. Uh, for a dollar a month, you too could have access to all of our bonus content. We are shamelessly there. self-promoting. <laughs> all written in our script. <laughs> in sum, probably none of our listeners know what Crowley's kind of privilege is like. And if any of our listeners do know what that kind of privilege is like, let me remind you one more time, our Patreon <laughs> is available and... Cult yes, confessions. Our Patreon friends are lonely. Yes, they are. They, we need more. We can always use more Patreon friends. In Hawaii, he met a married woman ten years older than he was. He is Alice. all over the place. Lo- yes. Yeah. yeah. So, climbing mountain women. In Mexico, <laughs> no, no, Hawaii, Hawaii Sri Lanka, Scotland. Now he's climbing volcano women. Um, <laughs> and Alice had come to Polynesia to escape her hay fever, um, and she carried on a t- because you, no, but really, As you do. <laughs> when you are upper class British. In the at the turn of the century, the fin de siècle, hay fever is caused to just take a trip to Hawaii. You just have to Must get you have nice. to get over that. I could go to Hawaii right now. <laughs> so the best cure for hay fever is a torrid love affair with Alistair Crowley in Hawaii. <gasps> just what? thinking about taking a vacation with Crowley. Oh, what? Crowley brought her with him to Japan before the relationship broke off, and she returned home. Back in Scotland, he played a prank on the locals by complaining to a society for the suppression of vice that prostitution was running rampant in his little town beside Loch Ness, where the Boleskine house was. When their inspector wrote to him saying he couldn't find any evidence of prostitution, Crowley wrote back saying it was conspicuous by its absence. What a prank. The fact is that the vast majority of people are absolutely impervious to facts. Visiting Edinburgh to replenish his wine stock and hire a housekeeper and pick up yet another mistress, Crowley befriended a painter named Gerald Kelly, who introduced him to the woman who would become his wife and his first scarlet woman, Rose. Physically and morally, Rose exercised on every man she met a fascination which I have never seen anywhere else, not a fraction of it. She was like a character in a romantic novel, a Helen of Troy or a Cleopatra, yet while more passionate, unhurtful. She was essentially a good woman. Her love sounded every abyss of lust, soared to every splendor of the Empyrean. Rose was a widow and was having an affair with a married man named Frank Summers. She was, by all accounts, a wild woman. To get money from her family, she lied and said she was pregnant, and then she used the money that they gave her for an abortion to buy dresses and enjoy a night out on the town with her married lover. Yeah, she's like, I need abortion money. Just kidding. I mean, not kidding, because she got one. That's dark. It is pretty dark, right? Yeah. yeah, that's Perfect way dark. Curly. Yeah, like most, uh, okay, I won't speak for women, but I assume many women would feel a little embarrassed going back to mom and dad and being like, I need abortion money. But that's just what she did to get a, a, a raise on her allowance. Just to go out. Yeah, just so <laughs> yeah. she could have a night out. Her family was pressuring her into marrying an available and uninspiring bachelor much older than her named Hill in an effort to settle her down. Curly suggested that she marry him instead and leave the relationship platonic, because he was sleeping with more than enough women. He could have a platonic wife. Uh, Crowley suggested uh, that she could get her family off her back and still go ahead and be Summer's mistress this way. The plan was for Summer's to keep her in a chateau of sin. The family tried to upset the marriage, but in Crowley's words, Rose stuck to her guns like the game little bitch she was. Ugh. What? <laughs> Sorry, he just has a way with words. <laughs> but the <laughs> but the marriage purged Rose of her love for Summers, replacing him with Crowley. And Crowley, for his part, fell in love with Rose. So this is a nice little romantic comedy. For now. <laughs> Hours after they were married, they consummated their union. He brought her home, where his redheaded mistress was due to arrive the following day. So he had this other mistress, remember? Uh, and, and he was supposed to meet her, but then he accidentally got married to a woman he decided he wanted to have sex with after all. <laughs> and he sent a messenger to intercept her at Inverness and send her back where she came from. So, so sorry, mistress. <laughs> Not anymore. Nope. I, I actually I don't like think that's my very wife, nice. So. What, what would you have done, James? 
she could still come hang out. Oh, you'd, you'd, oh. You'd, I mean, she came all the way. Just have tea. <laughs> For tea yeah, or, or whatever, you know? Or whatever. Just live in the moment. See where, yeah, probably. see where it takes you. <laughs> see where the night takes us. <laughs> um, Rose and Crowley took their honeymoon first in Paris and then at the Great Pyramid in Cairo. Again, because rich. And at this point, <laughs> you could get inside the Great Pyramid in Cairo. That's pretty sweet. Yeah, uh, un, like unguided. You just walk into it at any time. On their second visit to Cairo, Crowley underwent one of the great occult revelations of his life. So this is now a bit later in their relationship. Rose is pregnant, and Crowley attempts uh, to while away the hours by entertaining her with some sylphs of the air. What does that mean? Yeah, you know, like elemental air okay. spirits. Yeah, don't you guys? You guys are like uh, nerds. Don't you play them nerd games? With yeah, all your, you like know we play nerds. the nerd games with your else. sylphs and your undines and your <laughs> salamanders. No? Yes, yes, I, I yes. played India uh, as a salamander. <laughs> right, so then you know exactly what I'm talking about. But for our listeners, I understand, who have uh, lives. Damn. <laughs> just, just that's it, just lives? Rob's coming for blood. <laughs> yeah, he is. Okay. Rally's got oh, them we feeling. Love, Get back to the podcast. We love now. all our <laughs> D&D listeners out there, whoever you may be. Whatever, man. <laughs> <laughs> Rose couldn't see uh, the sylphs that Crowley was producing, but she was struck by a strange mood and started repeating to Crowley, they are waiting for you. This annoyed him. Yeah, it would annoy me too. The next day he attempted to conjure those sylphs again. When Rose told him that it was all about the child and spoke of Osiris, Crowley changed gears and invoked Toth. Toth uh, is the ibis-headed god of magic and science. What's an ibis? It's uh, like a, and it's a bird. It's like a like a crane. In oh, the, okay. You know, in the it's Chesapeake bird world. Of prey. Uh, the next day, Rose told him he had offended Horace and should invoke him instead. Invoke him instead. So, a faux pas among your Egyptian gods to invoke Toth when you should be invoking Horus. I see. Crowley didn't believe uh, Rose and asked her to describe the gods. He's like, no, you're not. You're not talking to Horace. That's nonsense. You're just some pregnant Rose. (laughs) And she's like, uh, according to Crowley, Rose knew less Egyptology than 99 Kyrene tourists out of 100. Uh, But she was able to describe Horace with an accuracy such that the odds of her being right were, according to Crowley, one in many million. And that brings us to today's brief history. Dun, da, da. A brief history of the Egyptian god Horus. Delightful. Horus was the falcon-headed son or brother of Osiris. A falcon is a bird, to y- clarify. Yes. Oh, it can travel up to 200 <laughs> miles per hour in a dive. <laughs> no. Now I'm just being mean. Crowley has you in some kind of mood. Yeah, I, I, maybe you're right. Yeah. <laughs> so Horus was the falcon-headed son or brother of Osiris. Set, another brother, now that's his name, Set. Set, yeah. Murdered yeah. Osiris. He's not a set of gods. He's a set of nothing. He's a set of himself. <laughs> yes. Set, yeah, how set. would we get through this? About... He was another brother. He murdered Osiris and usurped his throne. Yeah. Isis, their sister and wife of Osiris, reassembled Osiris' body except for his penis. Right, she couldn't which, find that. Yes, which had been devoured by catfish in the Nile. Right, catfish are always trying to eat your penis. You gotta watch out when you're going into any freshwater situation. Man. Thanks for looking out, Rob. Yeah, that's what happened to mine. <laughs> she, so, <laughs> Sam has his hand up. He thinks we're in class. Yeah, yes, Sam. Come, come up to the come mic, up, Sam. Come up to the mic. Gotta eat that mic, Gotta eat that mic. I just, I was reading this and listening to this. So Isis is their sister and the wife of Osiris. Osiris. So yes. Gods can have incest and it's cool. No, no, no. I'm just trying to figure oh, okay. out how that was pop- Like, So does he have two wives? Like her mother and then he married his daughter? No. I'm just trying to figure out how that's Isis possible. Isis was okay, the so sister I- of Set and Horus. Right? Right. Yes. Osiris was their, like... Oh, I see what you're getting at. His father and... So there, yeah, there must have been some... Well, unless Osiris... I don't actually know how he spawned them. I don't know. I don't remember. But Ra, the sun god, was the original god, so they all would have descended in some sense from Ra. 
Anyway. Anyway. Good question, Sam. Yes. To which we have no, no answers answer. for you. <laughs> so this Isis, uh, whose relation is questionable to the rest of the gods, <laughs> was was the wife That's of Osiris. That's the mystery. That's the yes. occult mystery. The occult mystery. And she reassembled Osiris's body, except for his penis, right. which had been dis- devoured the catfish. by catfish. We've yes. all been warned about the catfish. She fashioned a golden phallus to attach to Osiris and yes. conceived Horus on the phallus. Yeah, sometimes you get spam in your email about this. You, have you gotten these, James? You mean sperm? Spa- about, uh... <laughs> you get sperm in your email? <laughs> make your phallus golden? You haven't gotten these emails? No. Weird. She's a woman who did what she had to do, and right. I respect that. <laughs> Ever afterward, Horus, lord of the soil, has done battle with <laughs> Seth, lord of the desert. Yes. Oh. Now, Because the soil is uh, fertile. Yes, the soil is fertile, the desert, the is, desert only... is infertile. Except for cacti. <laughs> Indeed. And some animals. Indeed, and yes. Like those uh, little, yes. Scorpions. <laughs> yeah, the scorpions. Awesome. Exactly so. So, <laughs> let's talk Ra, guys. Ra. Ra, right. the, the sun god. Right. Whose worship goes back 2,500 years before the year zero. Indeed, years, yeah. many years, ancient yeah. god was eventually merged with Horus. <laughs> Horus can, like Zeus, be described as having different attributes, with Ra being one. Or for another vantage, he could simply be the newest incarnation of Ra. Yeah, sort of like Vishnu. Yeah, and that's a brief history of the Egyptian god Horus. Delightful. That yeah. was wonderful. Thank Full you. of yeah. mystery it was and pretty conflict. Brief. All the Egyptian like pharaohs were also supposed to be like incarnations of Ra, right? Yeah, they were all gods. I mean, it's depending on what point in oh, history. We they could also have yeah. attributes of Ra and different. Right. Yeah, yeah, incarnations. But they literally like worship them like they would have. I think. That's how you get a pyramid. Hell yeah. So that's how they did it. <laughs> At the Bulak Museum, Rose pointed out an image of Ra as Horus, as the god, uh, with which she had been communicating. The exhibit for Ra as Horus was numbered 666, Olivia. What? Which we know as the... Devil's number! The number of the, the beast. beast. Yeah. Uh, Rose gave Crowley instructions to invoke Horus, which he thought were rubbish, but she <laughs> pressed him to do it anyway telling him not to omit one detail, and he decided to humor her. Crowley performed Rose's ritual at noon in full regalia through an open window. The ritual failed. Everything happens in the middle of the day. Yeah, like, what's... Do they not have, like, real jobs? I guess they're <laughs> well, rich no, people. no, they don't. They're right. independently well. I have no time to do and what's rituals the deal with, during like, the day. <laughs> so Rose, instead of getting being, like, uh, having these, like, weird hungers as a pregnant woman, she's just like, I crave this ritual. Yeah, she did. She was a, she was a god craver. Me. Right? Me if I'm yeah. pregnant. <laughs> the ritual failed in part because Crowley felt exposed and ridiculous standing in an open window in full regalia, full occult robage. I feel like that says something if he felt ridiculous. Right, yeah. Because yeah. he walks around in a red robe and crown yeah, just to, say, to pass the time. Yeah. Maybe he doesn't like being yeah, told what to do. You can't see me. <laughs> Rose allowed him to try again at midnight, and this time was a resounding success. So, hey, midnight, yeah, you got to yeah. work a little. Can't you got to stay up. The, the following month, at Rose's instructions, he waited for a voice which gave him the text of the three chapters of the Book of the Law, which is the Law of Thelema, or Thelema. Uh, The book argued that humans should emancipate themselves from all limitations and erase all imposed moral structures and follow the rule of the law to do what thou wilt. Now, Thelema is the religion that he founded inadvertently, right? Now, yes. There is a religion of Thelema, yeah, that follows more or less Crowley's system. That was like the main, like, like not like western but practice like occult practice before like in the like 60s like witchcraft kind of came back and like wicca kind of oh. like overtook that as like the big like thing big thing to do now the dictum the dictum do what the... <laughs> she just wanted to say that word. i said it and then i was like probably they want time with that so i repeated it but i did want as it time turns with out it okay for a second the dictum well, now I dictum. feel pressured, and yeah. I, I'm, I lost interest. The dictum, to do what thou wilt, um, does not mean to do anything you want at any time. No. <laughs> uh, although it's often interpreted that way. This is the, the most talked about, probably, and the least understood aspect of Crowley's whole deal. So, really, 
this whole episode has been about getting up to these four words, do what thou wilt. And now uh, now we're at the point where we're trying to understand what in the heck they mean. Yeah, what do they mean, Rob? Well, we need to be in touch with our inner godhead and follow the direction it provides. I'll take Olivia's advice on this as she practices uh, this, this dictum. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so being in touch with that inner godhead is what it means to follow our will. Crowley says... In his confessions, it is a lie, this folly against self. Self Self-sacrifice makes no sense, he's saying, but neither does lying. We should always speak our truth and be in tune with it. We also shouldn't claim to have ownership over anyone other than ourselves. This alleviates a lot of sexual strictures. So our monogamous systems, clearly Crowley's not on board with, but for him, it's because we're not living ourselves. We're living others. We're living the ownership of others when we're trying to control their appetites and their desires. These secrets came to Crowley from a body of secret initiates. Here we go, secret chiefs again, led yeah. by Ivas, minister of Ra Horus. Uh, and they promised to continue to reveal their mysteries over time. For the last part of the episode, then, uh, let's take a look at some of the major themes of the Book of the Law, bearing in mind that the book itself asks that we not study it but rather destroy it after a first reading. In the spirit of this request, as I was preparing this episode, I actually only read it once, and I took my notes on it from that first reading. The first big theme is esoteric. The highest truths are hidden, and have been revealed specially to Crowley and his Scarlet Woman Rose. Only an elect few may bathe in the glorious light of revelation. Listeners who have followed us through this year will recognize the secret as a hallmark of European occultism. Indeed. American occultism, which was shaped in large part by the democratizing influence of spiritualism, had less patience for secrets. All right, so now we're going to hear from the the three gods that um, Crowley channeled into his book of the law. Uh, We'll begin with the goddess, the mother goddess, Nuit. Let my servants be few and secret. They shall rule the many and the known. These are fools that men adore. Both their gods and their men are fools. Now therefore, I am known to ye by my name, Nuit, and to him by a secret name, which I will give him when he last knoweth me. Since I am infinite space, and the infinite stars thereof, do ye also thus. Bind nothing. Let there be no difference made among you between any one thing and any other thing. For thereby there cometh hurt. The second and most famous theme is the primacy of the nature of the will, which joins together freedom and responsibility. We are free to do our will, but we are also responsible for being in touch with the depths of our being, to truly know our will and to act on it accordingly. This is the Godhead that he's talking about. Be goodly, therefore, dress ye all in fine apparel, eat rich foods, and drink sweet wines and wines that foam. Also, take your fill and will of love as ye will, when, where, and with whom ye will, but always unto me. But part of the quest to act according to your inner godhead is to aspire to secret knowledge, required to make contact with and understand the will of that godhead in this way, the themes begin to build on each other. Invoke me under my stars. Love is the law, love under will. Nor let the fools mistake love, for there are love and love. There is the dove, and there is the serpent. Choose ye well. He my prophet hath chosen, knowing the law of the fortress and the great mystery of the house of God. Third, the path to knowing the will is achieved through intuition and not through reason. In fact, reason is cast as an impediment to be avoided and personified under the word because. Now a curse upon because and his kin. May because be accursed forever. If Will stops and cries why invoking because, then Will stops and does not. If power asks why, then is power weakness. The fourth theme is the threefold nature of God. Through Ivas, we hear first-person pronouncements from the female god, Nuit, who is the circumference, and the male god, Hadit, who is the center of the sphere. Uh, 
So uh, there's a sort of family theme to this. We're hearing two different voices. Uh, we've got Ray doing the voice of Nuit and Brandon doing the voice of Hadit. Those are the mother and father gods, the male and female essence of God. They then have a child, Ra Horquit, who we've called Ra as Horus so far. Nuit is the nurturing force, Hadit is the violent and vengeful force, you see the feminine and the masculine, and Horus combines the best of both of them. Let's hear again from, let's hear then from each of them. We'll do Nuit, and then Hadit, and then Ra Horus, you can get a feel for how each of them uh, speak. So she answered him, bending down, a lambent flame of blue, all touching, all penetrant, her lovely hands upon the black earth, and her lithe body ar arched for love and her soft feet not hurting the little flowers. Thou knowest, and the sign shall be my ecstasy, the consciousness of the continuity of existence, the omnipresence of my body. So there uh, you can hear that, that feminine essence. Uh, uh, Olivia, do you hear the imagery there? Yeah. The earth, right? Yeah. The body of the mother goddess, right? She is receptive uh, and she's fertile. Uh, so now let's hear what the father god sounds like. I am the flame that burns in every heart of man and in the core of every star. I am life and the giver of life. Yet therefore is the knowledge of me the knowledge of death. Right, so there you can hear right, the violence, the aggression. Yeah, male energy. Yes, flame, right, mm -hmm. as opposed to earth. All right, now let's hear the child god, Rahoras. New is your refuge as Hadit your light. And I am the strength, force, vigor of your arms. I am the visible object of worship. The others are secret and invisible house there standeth, and shall stand until the fall of the great equinox, when Hrumachis shall arise and the double wanded one assume my throne in place. Hrumachis may be a transliteration of Hor M. Aket, or the incarnation of Horus at dawn. Hor M. Aket is also associated with the Sphinx. The reference here suggests, as Crowley often stated, that there is more to unfold and that it would unfold over time. So we see Nuit and Hadit as the sort of background force in Ra Horus as their uh, incarnation in a direct way, a communicative way. The fifth theme is the use of incendiary things in the context of magical ritual. Drugs? Are we going to well, talk about drugs? Yeah, but, are we going to talk okay, about blood? Drugs, are we going to talk yeah, about right. semen? There are you we going to talk about spit? <laughs> yep. What other bodily fluid are we going to talk about, Rob? You know, oddly, I think this episode has not uh, achieved an E rating until you began to <laughs> shout <laughs> semen. Semen! Although this might be the second time semen's come up, so maybe... It has actually yeah. come up. Yeah. I feel like I this think is the second right time now, today. I don't In like the, the phrase semen has come up. I don't know why I used it, and Siemens I don't like how up. you just all stop. Everyone stop. <laughs> it's come up. It's everything's coming. In the up emails, semen. right? Wayne, <laughs> 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 where are you? The fifth theme is the use of incendiary things in the context of magical ritual. These involve both drugs and bodily fluids. I love that. Like semen. Blood? Again, this draws on the earlier themes. There is a gendered character to the fluids, which suggests the triple god structure of the Book of the Law. And the use of bodily fluids violates taboos that open the adept up to set themselves free of societal strictures. So let's hear about what fluids exactly we're talking about. Can't wait. Ra Horus. The best blood is of the moon, monthly, then the fresh blood of a child, or dropping from the host of heaven then of enemies, then of the priest or of the worshippers, last of some beast, no matter what. This burn of this make cakes and eat unto me. This hath also another use. Let it be laid before me and kept thick with perfumes of your orison. It shall become full of beetles, as it were, and creeping things sacred unto me. Uh, so, Olivia, let's go through this a little bit here. Oh, we are not going to not The blood of the moon, monthly. Yeah. So, Period. Me menstrual blood, yeah. Yeah. That's the best blood to use. Okay, now here, this is where Cro Crowley gets a little tricky. He talks about the fresh blood of a child or dropping from the host of heaven. Is he actually talking about children's blood here? I feel like no. Who, what is he talking about? <sighs> well, I feel like... Semen. He's talking about semen. Yeah. <laughs> So when oh. Crowley talks about child sacrifice, uh, as he often does, what he's really referring to is the spilling of the man's seed. 
Which makes sense. Uh, then, uh, blood of your enemies and of the priests and worshippers. Uh, so now we're talking about fluids that come from other beings, right? right? So it's just the way we're combining fluids. But you can see the female fluid and the male fluid, the host of heaven and the menstrual blood. And he's literally talking about making a cake here. Mark it with a B. Throw it in the oven for Sam and me. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> Um, but we can see a kind of uh, underlying Christianity to this, right? I was about to say, like, the whole thing about animals being last, that's where that's where Christians went wrong, oh. sacrificing those animals. Right, the Jews originally were sacrificing animals. Yeah, that's what Jesus complained about. Yeah, they should have been using menstrual blood. Here you go. Uh, <laughs> that there's a kind of, like, host situation, right? Mm-hmm. Eating of the blood, right? This, this sounds Some, a little like, bit like communion. Substation, yeah. Uh, sixth, the sixth theme, uh, and the one that I think is going to be most controversial, is the trampling of the weak. This comes from Crowley's understanding of evolution. The elect are responsible for recognizing and loving one another, but they should oppress the non-elect, who are not worthy. So what? Wait, what do you mean by oppress? How would you oppress the weak people? What do they mean by weak is like physically weak or well to start it because they're not in your circle i was about to say you're not in the group yeah so you're already lesser like you're not in on it you know what i mean like and you would not offer them sucker sorry (laughs) can can you elaborate on that uh you mean like sugar help help okay sucrose (laughs) sucrose uh yeah you wouldn't offer them help or give them a leg up or you know help them get a job uh you you would leave the non-elect to their own devices let's hear uh how we divide the elect from the non-elect hadith love one another with burning hearts on the low men trample in the fierce lust of your pride in the day of your wrath ye are against the people O my chosen pity not the fallen i never knew them and I am not for them. I console not. I hate the consoled and the consoled. All right, this is arguably the most black magic sentiment in the Book of the Law, although most of Crowley's critics fixate on the bodily fluids. You said Crowley. <laughs> Thanks, James. <laughs> You're welcome. Its clearest articulation is in the second book from the Father God Hadith. The child god Horus tempers this a bit, but the language of killing enemies persists. The complexity of messages from different gods can make those of us inclined to disagree with this ideology wonder if he really means it. In his own interpretation of the law of Thelema in his confession, Crowley says, there is here a conflict between private and public morality. We should not protect the weak and the vicious from the results of their inferiority. By doing so, we perpetuate the elements of dissolution in our own social body. We should rather aid nature by subjecting every newcomer to the most rigorous tests of his fitness to deal with his environment. I think like Satanism, like modern Satanism definitely took that and made it better, (laughs) like made it more acceptable. You know what I mean? Like a lot of the things Crowley like says. Well, because he's accused of being a Satanist, but that's anachronistic. Right. But they definitely riff off of. How do they change it? Well, I, we'll talk about it actually coming up. We got but... a two episode series on the Satanists, but we can okay. we can. They just tease make it. it a, 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 I want. I don't want to say a nicer version of that, but this idea of like, don't waste your time with people that aren't worth your time. Basically, like people that are inferior, don't even bother. Okay. Inferior can mean something different to everyone, though. You know. Yeah. 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 The idea is that we should allow people who um, are incapable of grasping the mystery or incapable of pursuing the mystery yeah. in the way that, you know, we are and our listeners are, right? We're a kind of elect. Um, so we would say to all the people who just don't get what we're up to here, well, screw them. They're, they're not interested in their soul. They're not interested mm-hmm. in, you know, these questions of God and all the, you know, crazy things that we bring up here. It's like occult survival. So they're on their own. Yeah. <laughs> and we just should let like them fall show. away. Yeah. <laughs> it's survival, but Crowley survival. <laughs> I mean, if you think about, like, you know, the Mormons are sort of the stark opposite, that they go around yeah. trying to convert everybody because they don't want them to go to bad heaven. They want them to go to the best Mormon heaven where we all drink decaffeinated soda. Um <laughs> So no I think, coffee. I think, I don't know if we can, I don't even know if we can drink that. Um, I have to check. I have to check my Book of Mormon. Um, but, or Savannah. Right, yeah. right. 
in any case, uh, so that's what he, that's really what, what we're talking about here is, you know, when we think about the mass of humanity that just won't come up to ask the questions that we're asking uh, or, or to probe these, these, these themes, they're on their own scrum. Mm -hmm. um, so true men and women of will are part of an elite in Crowley's universe. They are not just one of the people. And those who fail to rise to the challenge of living according to their will are not to be pitied or helped. Their weakness shows that they deserve their inevitable destruction. This sounds a little sociopathic, but it actually isn't. Um, Hadith's injunction is not just to trample the weak, but for the elect to love each other. And Crowley believes that it isn't only the weak that nature will plow under, but also the vicious. A true sociopath who is always out for himself cannot survive. His tribe will rise up and drag him down. The elect form their own tribe, where no intra-trampling is permitted, although they freely oppress those as we're talking about, who do not rise to their ranks. If you're a regular listener, you'll probably guess that I take issue with this theme. I, uh, we've been talking about it, and I've been trying to justify what he, what he means here, but I personally prefer the yogic Buddhist vision of humanity, where we're, we're all in this together, working for our collective enlightenment, and we're all pushing ourselves toward that. We're becoming more conscious with each uh, reincarnation, or whatever you want to say. Um, whether or not we're reincarnated on earth or our spirit goes off to some other place. Uh, I actually keep an image of Alvalo Kitas Vara, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, in my office. That's how much I'm on board with this. Uh, and the theme of the Bodhisattva is that they have made a commitment not to leave the round of rebirth through enlightenment until all living beings have achieved enlightenment. Um, this kind of compassion is fairly alien to Crowley's vision, right? Yeah. It's kind of alien to human nature, too, though. I don't know, James. Uh, it would I, be nice to believe that everyone works together. I want to believe that, too. <laughs> but based on our history, it doesn't really work right. out that well, way. Right. I agree that our history is, is not a, the best guide, but I think that there are well, compassionate that, figures, right, throughout history. Absolutely. Well, that's a point. Like like what I was saying, like each, gen, uh, I guess each generation or whatever, it, it gets better. And it's my, right, so, so for, when I have a student come to my office who just isn't getting it, uh, and I get frustrated with them, I turn to Avalokitasvara and I say, I need to be patient and compassionate with this student so that I can help them along their path, whatever that may be, intellectually, spiritually, what have you. Uh, if I were Crowley, I would say, this moron, this moron, good, that's it. <laughs> good luck. You deserve to be trampled into the gutter. Have you are, fun. yeah, you will never discover your soul and yeah. that is your destiny. Um, so it, it's sort of the orientation we want to take toward the world. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just saying, like, it's, it's nice to, to want to be that way, but the world seems to operate more along Crowley's standards. I think you're right, yeah. So, uh, I mean, I guess the challenge to us is do we choose to follow the example of the Bodhisattva and the Buddha, or do we choose to follow the example of Crowley? I can't wait to talk about Satanism and see what James then, like, based <laughs> off of that, I'm just, I can't wait. <laughs> I, I, because I, I think we are weak, James, and, and I am weak, and I'm not perfect, right? But uh, what is my ideal that I'm striving toward? Because that will determine my choices. And if my ideal is Crowley, then I'm going to go one direction. If my ideal is, is more yogic or Buddhist, then I'm going to go the other way, or even spiritualist to a large extent. The final theme is the book's own incomprehensibility. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a mess, it's but a it's a It's a theme, yeah. Beautiful mess. It, it self-references how <laughs> incomprehensible it all is. The true secrets of the book cannot be read in the words themselves. To try and make sense of this revelation is to miss the point. Horace, please. This book shall be translated into all tongues, but always with the original in the writing of the beast. For in the chant shape of the letters and their positions to one another, and these are mysteries that no beast shall divine. Let him not seek to try, but one cometh after him. Whence I say not, who shall discover the key of it all? Even Crowley, the beast himself, cannot fully understand the meaning of what he's written. The study of this book is forbidden. It is wise to destroy this copy after the first reading. Whosoever disregards this does so at his own risk and peril. These are most dire. Those who discuss the contents of this book are to be shunned by all as centers of pestilence. I guess that's us. Oh, I'm proud. Swing and a miss. Not gonna lie, I've 
turned out we were centers of pestilence. <laughs> well, you're you're cheating the system too, man. We are centers of pestilence. Uh, yeah. We gotta go home and take a shower at least. I, I think. never <laughs> said that I was. I I feel like pestilence oh, right well, now. Yeah, honestly, I, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so. You smell like Vicks Vapor Rub. It's the tissues. Crowley isn't usually <laughs> credited with being an existentialist, but his hostility to organized religion, uh, his hostility to organized legal systems and social systems, feels a lot like Sartre, the uh, the Jean-Paul Sartre, the lead philosopher of existentialism. For those of you who are tempted to turn off the episode at the mention of a French philosopher, I promise we're almost done and we're not going to talk about Sartre for very long. Uh, <laughs> the whole existentialist movement was about living according to your own values rather than accepting them from outside sources. And also it was about taking full responsibility for your choices. This is in Crowley, except he's added this layer of secret chiefs, which seemed to blow the whole thing up. Right? <laughs> Because yeah. there are these higher powers. Uh, follow the dictates of your own will, but seek the ultimate truth from a secret occult group. So if we caught Crowley in a paradox, I, I actually think not exactly. Mm. The will and what are you what are you what are you thinking over there? No, I agree. I don't think. What don't you think? I don't think it's a paradox. I think <sighs> mm. you keep going. The will and purpose of the secret occult group is actually beyond our comprehension, and their lessons cannot be grasped through traditional forms of understanding, the way we're trying to reason through whether Crowley makes sense or not. Their words are to be read and discarded immediately, and the only thing we can be sure of is that they are beyond study, and their meaning is beyond even their interpreter, the beast Alistair Crowley. And all of this throws us back on ourselves. In this way, the Book of the Law functions as a kind of dream or work of art. The meaning is in the eye of the beholder, and it tells us as much about ourselves as it does about its subject. It's no accident that Crowley fancied himself a gifted poet and bragged about being better than almost anyone at the craft of writing. I love him so much. I'll have to admit uh, that as I'm saying this, I'm realizing the degree to which I'm seeing my own spiritual and intellectual values in the book. I believe that the highest goal any human can strive for is to immerse her or himself in the mystery of being, knowing the whole time that anything like full understanding is impossible. The mystery is always beyond us, and the act of making sense of it, knowing that we can never truly grasp its meaning, is what life is all about, and what makes living beautiful and meaningful. I read this in Crowley, and I agree with him, but I also read things that I don't agree with so much. Even the crudest magic eludes consciousness altogether, so that one is able to do it. One does it without conscious comprehension, very much as one makes a good stroke at cricket or billiards. One cannot give an intellectual explanation of the rough working involved, as one can explain the steps in the solution of a quadratic equation. In other words, magic in this sense is rather an art than a science. That's amazing. <laughs> what? Are you asking me? I wasn't asking. It's just magic is an art rather than a science. It really resonates. You can jive with that. Yeah. I mean, I feel it. I'm an artist, so. <laughs> I was about to say, yeah. we're all artists, and we're I, sitting I here doing that. I, I jive podcast. with that. <laughs> You're on board, Shannon? Yeah, I mean, we're all creative people. We're all performers. Uh, and I think we can feel in the act of performance, sometimes we're discovering new things about ourselves and about the world. I mean, you always talk about ritual and theater. Sure. Ritual, yeah, so. ritual and performance and slipping into the black pool. Right, the black pool of consciousness. And that's what, you know, when we're really flowing in the creation of art, right, when we're really making something new, I think we're, we're like James is saying, we're dipping down into that black pool to discover those hidden mysteries much as Crowley did when he wrote the Book of the Law. All right, now that you know the Law of Thelema and what it's all about, uh, at least according to this scholar, uh, we've still got things to do. Yes, we do. Uh, Sequel? Well, yeah. Uh, so this is going to be the first time we do a two-episode series within a series. A series within a series. Uh, so we're doing two episodes on Crowley. And we need to get to all the black magic stuff that he got up to with his drugs and his sex and his fluids. I'm so excited. Uh, <laughs> the things he thought paled in comparison to the things he did as far as persuading the media that he was, in fact, the wickedest man in the world, which he ended up doing as a sort of marketing maneuver. 
But that's going to have to wait for our next episode, friends. Uh, so this is our Aww. teaser. Yep. Uh, <laughs> You've been teased. We're going to get the whole Crowley done, I think, in November, though, if I looked at my calendar properly. Uh, but uh, we just can't do it all in one day. So uh, We can spread it out. We can do Crowley forever. Let's bring them on home. <laughs> Part oh, one. Bring part I hereby one adjourn and declare close this meeting of the secret order of alchemical actors till such a time as we get together and do it all again. All right. Uh, my name is Rob C. Thompson, a doctor of occult history and philosophy. I am joined uh, in my discussion today by Olivia Litteral. I am going to marry Crowley in the afterlife. In hell. <laughs> Shannon Landers. <laughs> Who is now... Uh, the, oh, yes. Insta- Instaquisitor. Yeah. The Instaquisitor. Oh, and by the way, if you haven't seen the picture of the cat we were talking about in the beginning of the episode, it is on our Instagram at yeah. Cult Confessions. Yes. And if you don't look at it, the Instaquisitor will come get you. Yeah. You know what we didn't mention? Uh, we had a, an exchange with Ian, uh, who had suggested oh. Ian, a uh, friend of the show. <laughs> so mad. Right. He had suggested Tech Help, uh, and in, in our our Halloween special, we couldn't make sense of Tech Help. I googled it. I went to Urban Dictionary. <laughs> I like. Ian very animal. kindly uh, suggested that perhaps I'm in some sort of. Uh, uh, early uh, early fatherhood slump, right? That it, because I'm not yep. sleeping as well with my infant, that that's the reason I didn't get it. But I'll be <laughs> honest, Ian, I never catch that kind of stuff. <laughs> I just thought it was a cool name. Yeah, uh, I always uh, when I see words, I I, I think it's the, in the inner occultist, right? When we see funky words, we always just <laughs> we want just, them to mean things. We don't so, bat an eye. Yeah, we're just we like, don't. Yeah, so yeah. we found out that it is black cat backwards. Yeah, tac- tacalb. Calb. Black cat. Yeah. backwards uh so james Caplangis, uh rounding uh, out our yes thanks for listening captain of the table oh, uh so the voices today that we heard uh we had brandon walls as the f- father god hadith uh we had ray candela as the mother goddess nuit and sam joining us for the first time sam steen uh, playing Ra Horus. How do we think Sam did today, guys? He did pretty good. Did pretty pretty good. good for a rookie. Yeah. Uh, and last but not least, and we'll be hearing more from him playing the coveted role of Alistair Crowley Crowley, Jacob Wheatley. Fine job by Jacob today. I think we already agreed that I won and it's Crowley, but... In any case... Uh, <laughs> We want to encourage you all, as always, uh, to kindly consider uh, first subscribing to the podcast to make sure you don't miss that next episode, yes. uh, to write us a nice review, as our friend the llama did, the llama llama lumps, llama lumps. Llama lumps. Uh, or uh, if you're feeling uh, generous and would like to give us a buck or more a month, we would love uh, to have that support. <laughs> to keep us going here and uh, buying equipment and on the, the various or maybe you can tag us in fan art oh, oh fan art fan yeah art. i don't know what they would draw but <laughs> all right shannon here's your challenge before we come back for our, our second part of crowley i want you to come back with some ideas about what fan art might comprise draw me getting married to crowley or, or uh all right stop stop okay. think about it go yeah, into the dark do the dark cloud I'll the black cloud the, the dark cloud of consciousness the dark pool for... go fishing in the dark pool of consciousness and then you can come back with ideas Nobody yeah. draw Olivia marrying anybody just yet. Please, please do. We need right. to vote on this in the no. secret orders, secret no. ballot. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much again for listening. We love you guys, uh, and we look forward to bringing you part two of Alistair Crowley next. Woo. Bye. We always make that ghost we sound. We need some sort because of it's spooky. Tune.